like to thank the organizers for inviting me, especially to Dr. Sanjay Agarwal, and of course my friend and former colleague, Dr. Anjali. Uh, good wishes to all of you who are in the hall, and uh, let me begin my presentation. So I'm going to talk about uh, generation two basal insulin and how to leverage time in range. Uh, first part of my presentation will be about clinical implications of glycemic variability and time in range and in range study, recent evidence on time in range. Uh, let me begin with talking about the clinical uh, implications and of glycemic variability and time and range. So beyond HPA1C, time and range is a very important and uh, important metric because it detects glycemic variability. If you look at the time and range, it also tells us the time below the range. So that is very important about it. And it also excess glycemic variability uh, and suboptimal time in range can significantly impact people with diabetes and guidelines also support it. A low time in range is associated with a higher risk of retinopathy, microalbuminuria, neuropathy and mortality. International guidelines also recommend time in range as a key metric to effective diabetes management. Uh, Glucose fluctuations are a process in time with two important dimensions. One is the amplitude and the other is a time. So understanding time and range targets are very important for both type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but important to just remember that if 70% of the blood glucose levels are between 70 to 180, that's an acceptable target for time and range. And above, could be less than 25 to 5 percent depending on the time, but very importantly, the time below range should be below 4 percent in the majority and below 1 percent when you look at very elderly people. So if you look at higher, just like we say, older people, we relax the HbA1c targets. For older people who are frail, we also relax the time and range targets to about 50 percent. So if you see an elderly gentleman or a lady, if the blood sugar levels are 50% um, of the time within normal, we say that the time in range is about 50% and that's okay. These are the studies, uh, the presentation is on generation 2 basal insulin and these are all the studies which look at the generation 2 basal insulins which are glargine U300 versus Degludec. And these are, some of them are PKPD studies, and some of them are real world studies, and a few are randomized control trials. Now, I've seen data dissecting Glargine U300 and Degludec many times. Most of the data show that these two insulins are pretty similar, but this particular study, which I'm going to show you, is going to look at the time in range as an outcome between these two. So this is the in-range study, which looks at the recent evidence of time and range in type 1 diabetes, and this is a head-to-head -head randomized control trial. Now to understand the time and range, you require a continuous glucose monitor, which measure, measures blood sugar levels throughout the day, and if 70% of the time the blood sugar is between 70 to 180, the time is in range is supposed to be good. And most of these glucomet, the continuous gluco, glucose monitoring devices that are used usually measure the blood sugar levels every 15 minutes. So you get about 96 blood sugar readings a day. You multiply that by 14, you get a quite a good number of readings. So the results of the study, this study looked at adults 18 to 70 years with type 1 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is important to consider because type 1 diabetes is an endocrine disease and there's a hormonal deficiency and you are replacing the hormone. Uh, these people had an A1C of between 7 to 10 percent and had been naive to basal insulins, uh, second generation basal insulins. And they were randomized to Glargine U300 or Degludec. And there was a, a treatment period for about three months and the primary and secondary endpoints were the time and target. That means what percentage of people achieved a time and target of more than 70%. In other words, what percentage of people had a blood sugar level that was 
in target at least 70% of the time. The secondary endpoint was the coefficient of variability, which is a uh, indicator of glycemic variability. There were other secondary endpoints like the time above range and the time below range and of course some other safety related endpoints. The baseline characteristics were similar in the two groups. The age was about 42 years. Uh, uh, the body mass index was about 27. The initial proportion of people with a high A1C was similar in the two groups and other factors were also similar. What the study showed is that the time and range was really similar in these two groups. So Glargine U300 is non-inferior to Degludec if you look at the percentage time and range. If you look at the secondary endpoint, glycemic variability, again, there was really no difference between the two. If you look at other secondary endpoint data, the patients began with a similar A1C, ended with a similar A1C. So that means there was really no difference. If you look at hypoglycemia again, there was no difference. So what is the importance of this study? Sometimes you don't require a positive study showing a statistical superiority. Even a study which shows similarity, non-inferiority, show that two treatments are similar is actually good enough in clinical practice. And in fact, if you see negative studies, they are also very important. So this study, which is really a non-inferiority study, showed that if you look at the glycemic control in terms of time and range, Glargine U300 and Degludec were similar. If you look at the main secondary endpoint, the coefficient of variation, Glargine U300 and Degludec were again similar. And if you look at the hypoglycemia and safety profile, these two insulins were similar. So if you look at this in type 1 diabetes, as I mentioned, in type 1 diabetes is an endocrine disease where you have an insulin deficiency and you correct it with insulin. Type 2 diabetes has got other problems like insulin resistance and obesity, which may make the pure effect of insulin a little more difficult to discern. If you look at this paper presented in the ADA 2022, again, it showed that the coefficient of variability was similar. There are several strengths of this paper. The strengths of this paper which shows that now Glargine U300 is more economical than Degludec. And Glargine U100 is a fantastic insulin, is more economical than Glargine U300. And we as doctors need to be aware of what the costs are for each therapy and then prescribe it to our patients, keeping the cost, benefit, affordability, and requirement in mind. The strengths was that this study was a prospective multicenter randomized study. Uh, it had an active comparator. Both groups had active drugs. They used some clinically important continuous glucose monitoring metrics and this CGM uh, was shown to correlate with the three-month glycemic outcomes. Now, if you look at the limitations, the study had some limitations. It was an open-label study design and maybe the CGMs could have been done for a longer period of time. So friends, I'd like to conclude by saying that the use of continuous glucose monitoring is a very good tool it's an expensive tool, it's not for every patient. But even if your patient on basal insulin is not on continuous glucose monitoring, you can be assured that you are giving an insulin which covers for the time and range when you prescribe it in routine clinical practice. At present, there's no CGM literature which a direct head-to-head -head, uh, uh, study. And in range was a multi-center well-designed study of type 1 diabetes randomized and showed that Degludec and Glargine U300 were largely similar. This study demonstrated that Glargine U300 is non-inferior to Degludec and it's similar glycemic variability. And in clinical practice, this means that our patients with type 1 diabetes could be treated with Glargine U100 and rapid-acting insulin. And if you find that these patients have variability, hypoglycemia, and they do not wish to take Glargine U100 twice a day, then you could escalate it to Glargine U300 or Degludec. Now given that both have the same price, both have the same effect, the more economical one would be Glargine U300. And the in-range study showed this in routine clinical practice. 
I think in, my, in the beginning I forgot to thank Dr. D.B. Kadam who was the chairperson. So thank you, sir, for chairing this session. And I think questions are at the end. Yeah. So thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, sir. Pleasure to be here.